Welcome to everyone. Thank you for being here. So um, uh, today, we've got Julian Holder, who's a historian and uh, English heritage uh, expert, expert on prefabs, and Ian Aglay, who is uh, an architect and who's done a lot of research on, the, on prefabs. Uh, well, I'm, something, I'm just an enthusiast, really. Uh, I've got no um, interest in prefabs other than the fact that, um, that they're, they're the only really successful promise of, of mass-produced housing that I can think of that anybody really likes. Uh, and there's obviously lots of examples of, of mass-produced um, domestic architecture, but uh, uh, usually it's, it's um, variously tested or exploded uh, in, in dramatic demolitions, and, and, the, and the, the, the prefabs have got a particular, there was a particular moment coming out of the, of the Second World War and, and all of the chaos and devastation of the Second World War, and with a sense of promise, it's just fascinating, really, and, and I'm starting to get interested in, in, in learning more history, because it's not a history we get taught at Architecture College at all. It's considered to be a vulgar um, design uh, and substandard. I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about I suppose, my involvement because it's both a, a personal interest and in certain respect to become a, a professional one as well. Um, part of my childhood was spent in Bristol and uh, a family friend lived in a prefab. Uh, I was taken down the road one day um, after school with him and his wife for tea and went into this you know, wonderful little building was here. And when you're, I suppose I'd been eight or nine, you know, there was something about it. Just impressive. It was like going into a little doll's house or something. Or uh, there's some sort of fairy tale about them. And it was it was wonderful. So every excuse I had, I would then take to invite myself to tea and <laughs> call in on these people. And, uh, uh, they were very polite. They pretty much fed up with me. But then go on a few years later. Um, and I'm at University College London <coughs> in the School of Architecture. And I bumped into an old school friend who's in the year above me. And we're both doing history of modern architecture and design there, uh, at postgraduate level. And he's doing his dissertation on one of the 11 different types of prefab, the one called the Aero House, which is, it's not like the Aero Chocolate Bar, it's like uh, <laughs> Aero, it stands for Aircraft Industries Research on Housing Organization. It was an attempt by the aircraft industries to think, what do we do at the end of the war when people aren't going to want to buy aircraft anymore? The fact that the plane's dead and got the tool up for something else. So Brian was doing this research on aero houses, which was fascinating. Um, and on this particular course that we were both doing, there was a heavy accent. I suppose this is where I was wrong to make fun of you. There was a heavy, heavy accent on housing. That is unusual right. in schools of architecture, where you were taught to be architects, the capital, ah, yeah. big, yeah. grand projet, <laughs> not little houses. Yeah. 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 Uh, English heritage, in its infinite wisdom, in 1990, I think it was, listed a major post-war building, well, its favourite building in Ipswich, by Lord Foster. And that caused such an uproar that it was decided we needed to have much stricter ideas and criteria on what could be listed of the recent past, from 1939 onwards. And knowing of the interest that I developed, dare I say, at modest expertise, um, I was asked to be a consultant and advise them. So it was great, basically, it was paid to go around the country in prefabs or trying to find out where they still were. I had a list of where they'd all been in 1957 when they were offered to the local authorities to buy back, because they only meant to last 10 years, so 10 years was up. Government said, right, we can knock them all down, or oh, hang on, maybe the local authority wants to buy them off us. Um, so there was a list, but quite often, I noticed you mentioned this in your book and in your talk the other week, you turned up and you found a concrete slab, mm -hmm. which is really quite, you know. Get very excited. Say, oh yes, they were still there last yeah. year. <laughs> you get there, and there's nothing. Um, I reckon in about 1995, there's probably about 2,000 left. And in those days, Bristol was prefab heaven. They had almost every type yeah. spread out all over the city mm -hmm. in really interesting different locations. 
you know, in, in cemeteries, in kitchen gardens, and laid out in unimaginative ways, laid out in imaginative ways, and most of them they've gone. Well, we should go back to Bristol. I think yeah. there's no more now. Do you no. know? Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't honestly know. Um, I think there are a few because one of the great things that happened politics aside, uh, is that some people under the right to buy policies of Margaret Thatcher yes. bought some. So, yes. And in right. some places, mm. um, those have survived. But then they've also, one of the things that really interests me, and tell me if I'm going on too long, Michelle, yeah, no, 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 uh, no, no, no. <laughs> is what people do with them. Uh, yes. And their afterlife. Yes. Um, yeah. Not just as home. So I, I've seen them used for chicken coops. I've seen them used in stables for donkeys. I've seen them used as sports pavilions, uh, you've seen them being used as garages, um, all kinds of interesting adaptations. Yeah. They move around all on the same site quite often. Um, so even though they're pretty good in rare, ones in good condition that you could look at and it would look like it might have not long after it was completed and getting even rare. So you've got to look hard underneath the surface. But also what's happened on the surface is rather wonderful. At the same time, um, uh, interesting days. I know Elizabeth's interested in the overseas as well. I was contacted a few years ago by the curator of the Open Air Museum in Holland, where we put one next to the bridge at Arnhem after the um, parachute dropped the British troops in there. And it stood there for years and years and years. And now it was up for demolition. And everybody was so attached to it. They were contemplating doing what we've done in this country and put it into an open air museum. Yeah. So you go along and don't see traditional timber frame, well, traditional timber frame buildings all of a sudden the little asbestos prefab. <laughs> um, so there's this. Did they do it? Yeah, I believe so. I contacted the curator recently and he's moved on. So they were in negotiations. I've got to go on their website and check. Um, but what, and to be really, really picky, it, it is strictly speaking a prefab in the way that I would discuss them. Um, I was commissioned by English Heritage to look at the housing that was constructed under the Emergency Temporary Housing Act. So just took about 156-ish thousand prefabs built in four years from 1944 to 48 and closed it. Although there were other things called prefabs. So it was more like Hutton? It was more like Hutton. Yeah. That I think was taken over in the gliders. Yeah. That landed at our um, yeah, which is an astonishing story. Yeah. And then it just stood there by this bridge for 40, 50 years. Um, and it's much loved by the local Dutch people who remember the landings, the liberation, and this hat appearing. Um, and so there are plans to put this open air museum. So it sounded fairly advanced, and they did lots of research on it. But, uh, so that's my interest and involvement. It's partly personal. So the question about the English heritage is, um, so there were some which were listed mostly in Birmingham, mm -hmm. uh, some in Bristol in the past, mm -hmm. some in Cap, in Cap, I think so, yeah, uh, and, uh, uh, but it doesn't, it doesn't, and some in Catford, there are yeah. six in Catford, yeah. but it doesn't mean that they are saved. Yeah. So I think that's something which needs to be explained a bit more, if you can explain. Um, well, yeah, all listening is merely um, a presumption in favour of preservation. It doesn't mean, as those that attack this in policy like to say, it's pickled in aspect, you can't touch it, you can't hold it. I, I wish that were true, but especially when it's so many people living, you have to take that into consideration. And especially if you're using, as practically all these examples are, um, untried, untested, non-traditional building materials, mm -hmm. which may fail. Um, so I think from a listening point of view, it's been hugely risky, and dare I say it to my employer, who I don't always agree with, um, somewhat heroic to have listed buildings only designed to last 10 years. Yes. Uh, is, it, is it a low grade listing? Like, they're grade 2 that you can't touch, it's not a grade 2 listing, isn't it? Uh, no, you can, you, can, you can touch any. Grade 1. You, all, all you need to touch multi listed buildings is listed building permission. Mm -hmm. So you have to make the case. You have to say, for example, we want to put double glazing in, mm. and there's going to be um, extra glazing bars appearing. Um, the people that advise on whether that should be given consent or not may think there isn't a great deal to a prefab. Mm. 
Mm. And putting symmetric glazing bars will alter the balance of the side. So, no. Could you not do it in the original glazing pattern? I say, oh, yeah, okay. Quite often people come along and want to do things mm. for very good reasons, but haven't thought about the implications of being listed in buildings. It's the easiest way to get back to the years just after the war, isn't it? It's a door into those few years. Because where do they put them? Um, as I said, at Bristol, the most astonishing thing I found was they put them around in the municipal cemetery. Beautifully sighted, all these photographs with the crucifixes and gravestones and pre yeah. and, you know, and what does that say? They're temporary. They're temporary. They're, they're, we don't intend them to be here very long. Yeah. But they were allowed to put them there. Yeah. Well, and in a room. Yes. They must have been plenty of other places to put them. Yeah. Why but, 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 quite nice. Yeah. Okay. Close to your mother. Close to your father. Close to your mother. But astonishing. Free life also put them in dead. <laughs> but also they put them in a, uh, a walled kitchen garden of a stately home. Yeah, it's all laid out in a very pretty way with yeah. burglars and trellises and their prefabs. Wow. So, for me, sighting is crucially important. And when I drew up guidelines and criteria for English heritage, when I was a consultant mm -hmm. working on this project years ago, I said it isn't just a fabric, it isn't just a building, because you can pick it up and put it up. Oh, yeah. You know, museum, that's very nice, you can go and visit them. Yes. But if you want to understand what was happening and the emergency reconstruction period, you need to understand, and I think the Scalbro State is a really good example of, that looks like blind panic to me, doesn't it? You lay them down unimaginative roads, mm -hmm. like a barracks, because yeah. they're not going to be here very long. Yeah. But that, Might be a lot of the landscape and go. But that, and there, there was mm -hmm. the guidance on layouts yeah. from the Ministry of Works, and yeah. the beautiful hand yeah. manual that they're producing. Exactly, which they, obviously yeah. didn't, which they obviously didn't follow a lot of the time. Well, what else is a problem? But it was a fantastic piece of propaganda yeah. at, the, at, the, at, the, at the transition of the war. So it, it, it kind of, it's got a, you've, you've listed a story, not, you've not just listed the physical thing, you've listed a, a story that's got many levels. Mm. And that's why they're important. So at one level it's a piece of propaganda for the, for the government looking forward to the case when they could afford to think that there was going to be a case in, 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 against Germany and in Britain's favour. Um, and, uh, The other, the other level is industrial. It's that the, the aircraft industries have, have got it ramps up aluminium production. I think with trying to find a way of, of keeping themselves going. Mm. That only ha their emergency wasn't the house people. Their emergency was to stop going out of business. Yes. The state funded enterprise. So it's, um, it, it, it depends whose emergency you're talking about. Really, mm. for, for the for the twenty year old, the emergency was where the hell am I going to live? Mm -hmm. Um, for for yeah. Winston Churchill, the emergency was something very different. Yeah, yeah. There, there was a fear, yes again, okay. what are we going to do? We've got to create jobs, create housing, and even though this was, was, was you could say it was a massive folly, doubled in price over a few years, um, but it still produced 156,000 temporary houses at the same time as we produced 300,000 permanent ones. So it did help. Uh, but I think fear of social unrest was always there and the possibility, yet again, of revolution. Right. Um, and it's another one of the reasons I love these things, because they're such sweet and so little things. And you think, hang on, they've got a place in sort of, you know, counter-revolutionary politics. Just to read them in that yeah, way. Absolutely. absolutely. I, I think yeah. it's, uh, yeah. Could anything look less, you know, revolutionary than a little archon with a pitched roof? And, uh, but there's elements of modernity in it, uh, the revolution, in the, in the natural production methods. But, uh, yeah, yeah, and they put a lot of effort like since 1942 to uh, yeah. convince people that uh, you know, prefabricated yeah. was the solution. Yeah. Like, sure, right. Right. Yeah. Somebody might make your dream come true and find in a garage an, aer an aero aluminium home that was yeah. carefully dismantled. Yeah. You know, these weird things happen, aren't they? Like, or, it's or on or eBay all of a sudden. Or even one of the American <laughs> ones was flat pack. Yeah. Yes. Sent over here has never been. Yeah, it's never been on the ground. Oh, I'm wearing a container. Yeah, but I'm only covered doors. Or the estate of um, CJ Moore. Yeah, yeah. Actually, no, we'll probably just find a warehouse full of covered doors. But yes! <laughs> <laughs> never been fitted. Raiders of the Lost Ark 3. <laughs>
Yeah. Was sagt ihr, Julia, Fotografie von Manchester? Pleasure. Thank you. 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 Thank you.